thing of a, a personal kind of case study uh, more than anything, because I find myself in this very fortunate. Um, have you, sorry, Pedro, have you, can you enable screen sharing from your end? Uh, okay. I've got a prompt saying the host has disabled it. No, you can, I think. Yeah, cool. Um, thank you. Welcome. So, yeah, so I find myself in a really fortunate position in this day and age here in Melbourne in that um, there are a few different contexts that I'm working across that have graffiti and street art as a sort of aspect of engagement for all of them. Um, and so I want to talk to a few of these things today. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you, Pedro, for accommodating us in Melbourne within the schedule. And I know that the, uh, the time zones are awkward. And also to the other co-conveners and all of the, the crew that I see here in my little grid here, like Peter and Jacob, for the continued energy and resilience and hunger in positioning you know, graffiti and street art into a critically engaged space. Um, and yeah, it's exciting that something like this is still going on in the world today, I think, despite what is happening. Um, so despite the nature of this pandemic, perhaps jolting what's been a collective sense of purpose, as well as critically redefining for us, at least in Australia, um, particularly in Melbourne, at the moment, what public spaces, urbanism and contemporary cities stand for and represent when around us all we're in the throes of the shutting down of all of these contexts. It's my understanding and belief that the culture of graffiti and street art and all the sort of expanded forms that have grown from it, um, including the practices that coalesce and spool from it, remains vital and in ways integral as to how we renegotiate what our urban spaces mean to us and why. Um, I present this to you all internationally on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging from our Indigenous population. Um, as of tonight, here in Victoria, the active sidelining of Australia's Indigenous culture can be felt through, I believe, the decision making that continues to marginalise vulnerable communities in this country. Victoria is feeling the tension of the decision to lock down a number of public housing towers in the inner city in a very sudden and bleak way as a result of coronavirus. These towers house predominantly refugee and newly arrived immigrant communities. And it's my understanding and sense that the shadows of our enduring and collective inability to apologize, integrate and reconcile the past atrocities of our developing national identity um, and philosophies cast a slanted light upon the way we continue to deal with difference collectively in Australia. I'd like to respectfully kind of segue here on this point of difference and seek not to conflate metaphors nor undermine the gravity of difference I referred to previously, but explore difference as it relates to street art and graffiti and its location within a broader academic context of social practice and research within this entice enticingly titled conference context of user human life-centered design. As an artist, researcher, and now educator, um, I enjoy sitting in this space of difference and I'd like to present a kind of field guide to one context, which as I alluded to earlier is somewhat my experience. I'd like a case study that um, I believe demonstrates graffiti and street art as a methodology that has enabled collaboration and the cross-pollination of ideas across communities. I think that the promise for the amplified acknowledgement of the culture's fluid capacity to operate at the nexus of social, political, technological, practical, innovative, collective, and aesthetic domains remains an important pursuit that reveals many ideas barely considered by large swathes of the population. Of course, this won't heal COVID-19, nor will it single-handedly end systemic racial injustice, nor will it solve the environmental emergency we face. But my experiences lead me to surmise that whether as practitioner, researcher, producer, curator, or many of the other expanded and integrated fields that the culture encompasses now, it affords one a way to scrutinize the world in a way that is grounded in difference. 
And I think that this is really important and that this difference brings forward strategies to negotiate the rapidly shifting world around us and how we interconnect, interrelate and collaborate. I engage with the culture of graffiti and street art across three different contexts. As an arts officer with the Victorian Municipal Council that encompasses the inner north of the city that includes the heftily graffiti and street art friendly suburbs of Fitzroy and Collingwood. Um, and I work here on graffiti diversion programs for young people. The diversion I offer is the provision of a safe and legal space for hundreds of hours to young scribes who have more often than not been referred into the program via police and court diversions and who through time have sustained significant unsanctioned graffiti practices while dipping their toes into the waters of more community mediated and consultative mural projects. My second context is as a coordinator and educator of an elective unit in street art and graffiti at the University of Melbourne. And my third context is as a researcher with a focus on Timor Leste in Indonesia, looking at an expanded research field of social practice where mark making practices have led to diverse and intermedial contexts of creative regional collaborations in public space. Three distinct educational experiences for me underpin this journey. Um, as a writer of the, the Monica Post between 1994 and 2004, whilst dabbling into other forms of urban interventions as well. Um, and then from 2004 until 2008, documenting the marks that emerged upon the surfaces of Timor-Leste as the country grew from the complexity and conflict of colonialism and genocide into nationhood. And whilst completing a practice led research thesis upon this subject, and now coordinating and delivering programs to young graffiti writers in Melbourne, Victoria, and journeying with them between the sanctioned and the unsanctioned contexts of practice, quite often financed, ironically enough, by government departments with funding designed to alleviate graffiti. As time and these experiences have ebbed and flowed, a couple of theoretical contexts have sharpened around the delivery of this work with particular focus on Southern theory and practical aesthetics. Um, I feel it important to outline these contexts for it means that my research and where I position myself falls into a category of social practice or artistic led research that has grown really out of the liberalization of what is understood as research in the academic world. A beneficiary, so to speak, of the dismantling of traditional scientific domains of knowledge and the hard yards of advocacy over decades of artistic inquiry to be recognized within institutions as a system of developing knowledge that is of value despite barriers to institutionalization and codification of art due to misconceptions of the artistic process as lacking cognitive value. Thus here, in the absence of a quantifiable analysis of any of my findings, I offer a more qualitative insight into what street art and graffiti does and why its measurement brings, to utilise Henk Bordoff's book title, Examining Artistic Research and Academia, a Conflict of the Faculties. Melbourne or Melbourne, as it's affectionately referred to, holds an important place in the history of graffiti and street art writing in Australia. The growth, as with so many other graffiti strongholds, begins with the receipt of subway art before works inspired by the pages of this visual ethnography flooded inner city train lines and the situationist inspired activations of people like Andy Mack and others during the 80s and 90s here saw the optimizations of service laneways in the city as cul-de-sacs of unsanctioned expression, drawing graffiti and more street art focused stylings into a, something of a dialogue together. Painted trains sneaking in and out of the city spilled into laneways and the grid-like construction of the urban precinct grew to germinate a culture and style that was parochial, innovative, public and exploitative of absence in something of an ironic counterpoint to the research of anthropologist James C. Scott, whose insights into the state and power demonstrated that urban design based upon a grid presents the state with a panoptical vision for greater efficiency of control. 
In Melbourne, graffiti and street art subverted the grid-like structure of the city to exploit a canvas, predicated as it was upon structural hegemony, that wound its way into the psyche of the city. The 2002 Commonwealth Games saw a significant strong-armed eradication and resting power given to police and government officials to rid the city of graffiti. Laws changed, more arrests were made, and a distinction which, still to this day, does exist, began being felt. The decades of graffiti writing was overwhelmed with the more socially, aesthetically, and politically acceptable notes of street art's capacity to represent the aspirations more closely of inner city life. The ironies of this conflicted relationship reached into many parts of different authority and regulatory bodies. Banksy's, for example, were removed by council endorsed graffiti removal services, whilst the same in images, photographed and duplicated, were masthead images to spruik the laneway culture, the state's tourism industry, enthusiastically sold to the masses. Studios and galleries dedicated to street art and broader urban practices flourished. Crews and collectives grew and extended their creative strength throughout the city and abroad in a seemingly unbridled enthusiasm. Leading Victorian graffiti and street art academics, Alison Young and Lachlan McDowell, began making significant contributions to local council policies and management frameworks. And the idea of a relationship between lawmakers and artists predicated upon negotiated consent became tantalizingly close. A registry of 100 significant works was developed by Lachlan McDowell, of which I had the good fortune to work on with him for the city of Melbourne. Lachlan also is responsible for the introduction of street art as a unit of study at the University of Melbourne. And I know uh, that now in taking on this role of coordinating this unit, I sit in a very unique position where we're at a leading institution in the state that is offering street art and graffiti as a form of study. And I know that Peter, you've done research and written a paper with John Lennon and others around street art within the academia. And um, it was a wonderful thing for me to read before I began my journey within the education sort of model. But um, yeah, as a result of this context, I think Melbourne has a very unique relationship to it. And it's certainly loathed and loved, but for it to be part of an academic, part of an institution like the University of Melbourne is very unique. So today then we find that the city is a sprawling topography of significant mark making practices, be they graffiti, street art, installation, intervention or otherwise. Around it, of course, as I am testament to having a role in education in it, industries have grown. So with this in mind, I'd like to spend the next uh, 10 minutes addressing the three positions I engage with the culture on. With the city of Yarra, a local Melbourne municipal government, um, their graffiti management framework is the conflicted canopy of a policy document that runs on a five year cycle that negotiates the inherent conflict of values of a progressive inner city municipality managing graffiti in accordance with a somewhat draconian state government graffiti act from 2007, whereby local government laws are expected to adhere to legislation that is over a decade old. The latest iteration of this policy's development that will run from 2020 to 2025, has sidelined the consultative and progressive measures of the previous six years, entrenching power back into the hands of an agenda that is predicated upon anti-graffiti and broad range graffiti eradication. Out of the same local council's youth dedicated services, I manage a program that engages with young graffiti writers who more often than not, enter the program in, on what is called a diversion. They've been caught by the police, oftentimes with other offences alongside the possession of aerosol or markers, and as part of their court diversion, are recommended into the program. I liaise with branches across council, arts and culture and city works, to name a couple, the Victorian police, neighbourhood justice centres, lawyers, community service agencies, and importantly, the families of these young people. In 2017, these programs began receiving significant funding from the Department of Justice, a State Department funding program to eradicate graffiti. 
The premise of my application was the provision of time. I argued that the safe and legal provision of space and time meant that young offenders were spending less time on the streets. The boring quantitative measures presented that 200 hours, for example, spent painting at the offices that I manage was 200 less hours that these guys were spent painting the streets. Uh, the sessions that we hold are on a weekly basis and they're punctuated by a broad range of professional development presentations from graffiti writers and street artists where career trajectories are itemised and tips and tricks of the trade are delivered to emerging practitioners. As a whole, graffiti diversion doesn't really work, as a lot of you would attest to, perhaps. Some of the most prolific inner city taggers enter into this program and do not abate their practices. What they do generate, I feel, however, is a registry of new experiences that changes the conversations they are having and with whom, whilst entering into an importantly new aesthetic and political dialogue with the culture. Boaventura de Souza Santos, one of the key figures behind the advancement of Southern theory, suggests that acknowledging other kinds of knowledge and other partners in conversation for other kinds of conversation opens up the field of infinite discursive and non-discursive exchanges with unfathomable codifications and horizontalities. Over three years, this program has entered into important local community contexts, presenting young scribes with an opportunity to engage with their community in a different way and be seen and experienced by those communities in a different light. Now, I have a highly sharpened attention to self-scrutiny and am the first to realise the very precarious balance that is being managed here around the culture. We use this program to encourage young people to be heard at a community level, engaging with different trader groups to present commissioned outcomes. They now form part of a panel, however, of consultation that goes into decision-making around policy. We walk a very fine line between the sanctioned and the unsanctioned and very cautiously open a doorway to writers to either walk through it or indeed defecate upon the front step. But, in opening up these new partnerships of conversation, we have been able to open up new aesthetic conversations also and deliver work such as this one that you see on your screens that have a socially just and fluid connection for young people, the community, and nod to the integration of the art form's capacity to be in dialogue across different public presentation platforms, such as video projection, which this mural was a 20 meter mural integrated with a video projection work in that window, um, sculpture, regeneration, decorative and educational contexts. So my question then to throw out to all of you is, is it a part of gentrification or is it a part of a critical dialogue of how the fugitive forms of graffiti breach boundaries and invite negotiations of agency and participation in making public? And this is kind of for you guys to, you know, mull over, I guess. My suggestion, however, is that the program might be a way of demonstrating the fluid. One minute, someone, these young scribes that we work with is transgressive. The next, they can be a poster child for a community beautification project. Oftentimes, and ironically, painting opposite or alongside their nocturnal transgressive habits. What is this doing? I think it's encouraging a critical, complex and contrary conversation of street art and graffiti in public and allowing the gaps in policy and practice to be animated and exploited. Importantly, at a bureaucratic level, it's allowing me to play beneath the surface tension of policy and regulation and integrate that which I have learned from the culture in an active and operationalized way that offers promise to the acquisition of knowledge particularly when aligned with new materialist research methods, that graffiti and street art as a methodology emphasizes modes of interaction and embodiment in seeking tacit forms of knowledge that reflect new social and other realities either marginalized or not yet recognized in established social practice and discourse. So this has now led me uh, and my enduring privilege and good fortune for the last two years to coordinate and deliver a breadth unit in street art at the University of Melbourne. The role is one I view as almost curatorial, 
where I present a historical international field guide to graffiti and street art practices framed by a pedagogical context of the culture's capacity to illuminate and negotiate conflict and highlight alternative narrative in public space. The curriculum is punctuated by practical painting sessions of which are facilitated by the aforementioned young graffiti writers, street art tours and a series of guest lectures that talk broadly to tactical concerns, community and activism, urban epistemologies and alternative practices. The course is also conscientiously structured around gender equality, where the course reader reflects the insightful and significant contribution of women to academic insight into the culture. And guest lectures are a 50-50 split of men and women practitioners. The reader that I present actively engages with a philosophy that honors the reality of contemporary graffiti and street arts development and advancement, beginning with people of color and immigrant communities. In this context, it's the theoretical work of Jill Bennett and the promise of practical aesthetics that anchors the philosophies and push for the recognition of graffiti and street art to sit within this idea of a broader aesthetic conversation. And my colleague Emerson Radisic will uh, illuminate more of Bennett's work in his presentation after this. But in raising this theory, I'd like to note the underexplored application of it to graffiti and street art that offers promise, particularly now in this international COVID context, to how artists, very practitioners and researchers might find accord with the theory and the shift that will be compelled to undertake as our public spaces are redefined. Um, so this broader conversation as well might envelop the future delivery of education in, in this field. And I have excused the scratchiness of the edit here, but uh, this semester with the lockdown restrictions in place, we had to innovate something for students around the tours that we give. And we did this. How are you? So let's begin, Michael. We're about to go now. We're walking, we're walking, we're walking through. Go a little bit straight. We're just going to flick up there. Because these are really interesting, these words that sit above the kind of building. And the local, the person. Yeah, you can keep talking when we're walking, man. So this uh, is on Sackville Street in Collingwood. That's where the earlier Everfresh was. So obviously it's strong. Distance, and look at that. <laughs> See, this is what I'm talking about as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we are practicing safe, keeping up a good pace. Huh? Oh, wait, stop! Because a student was asking me about this the other day, exploring the urban environment, finding these instances of how do you go from having this legacy and this image, Australia's kind of largest, tallest mural, their grappling gear down there and starts getting... Oh, to work quickly. You know, hey, we <laughs> Sorry, uh, that's you done. That's this done. What a pleasure. Um, again, my apologies there for the scratchy edit uh, that was put together quite quickly, but it was a two hour virtual tour that was done through the suburb of Collingwood for students. Um, so my final hook here of this presentation is a brief nod to the future, which of course is propelled by an acknowledgement of the past. This mark making practice has changed my life and in so doing, set in motion a collaborative context between myself and eight multidiscipline artists from Timor-Leste and Australia. This conversation, propelled as it was by street art and graffiti, began absorbing contemporary Indonesian artists, and as momentum was gained, splintered into different collaborations and contexts, framing multiple creative conversations under the canopy of Australia, Timor-Leste, and Indonesia's relationship since World War II. There couldn't be a more apt description than Pedro, the user, human and life-centred design that defines my reality and relationship to graffiti and street art. The aforementioned contexts now coalesce around a PhD I undertake, exploring how collective and public art practices and practitioners in the urban precincts of Jogjakarta, Indonesia and Dili Timor-Leste engage with their cities as a working material inviting narratives of connectivity and collaboration within our region across aesthetic, creative, 
and process oriented practices. My friend Vendi, an Indonesian street and comic book artist, has made the COVID-19 leap of practice in response to lockdown laws in Yogyakarta by giving an experimental twist upon his practice, engaging the public as a simulacra. These are digital images planted onto still images of, um, of Yogyakarta. The physical palimpsests sets are placed a lost, but the echo of effect of the sensory is sustained. The research I now undertake seeks to elaborate upon the sensory and the artistic as it materializes in public space. I aim to trace and accommodate the multi-pronged approaches of creative practice situated in a broader field of public culture as manifest in Yogyakarta and Timor-Leste with a foundation that is very much wedded and dedicated to street art and graffiti. So for me, Graffiti and street art sustain currency within this research paradigm as a methodological way to probe the way in which the visual and spatial politics of the city express historical conditions and urban subjectivities. Under the rubric of Southern theory and practical aesthetics, graffiti and street art practices reveal threads of interconnectedness, relationships and effect across multiple contexts of research, praxis, pedagogy and publics. They are practices that are user-friendly, human and humanely engaged with and life-centered, for they proffer a process of making other, a translation, if you will, as they index history and the present and inscribe the future. That's me. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, I think so. Hello? I can now, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, because I, I had some issues here. So, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I was, uh, well, a uh, lot of information. Uh, I guess if Anyone wants to to make some question or uh, comment to the to the presentation? Uh, please do it now, or save it for the end of the panel uh, gathering with the other contents. Uh, it's really interesting what you you are undertaking with this uh, with this practical introduction of street art within the academic context. Uh, I think it's one of the more um, experienced uh, experiments that are going on in the world nowadays. So it's very good to have your your input on that. Very good for you to have me here, Pedro. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, please go. So, uh, it's it's more of a practical or logistical question, I guess. Uh, I, I didn't catch what what is the context of of these tours of, of the of, of of the of the pedagogical um, uh, activities because I, I, I was looking up uh, the Center of Cultural Partnerships, uh, which is where I think Lachlan used to be, right? That's right, Peter. But yeah. that but that closed down, didn't it? It did. Yes. Yeah. So, so now I sit within the Victorian College of Arts uh, and street art is offered through the Victorian College of Arts, which is the, it's a different campus, but part of the University of Melbourne. So it, the unit is a breadth unit that's delivered to any undergraduate from any discipline. So up to 130 students, 70% of that cohort is, is international students. So next semester is going to be fascinating to see how many we managed to get. Um, and so, yeah, so it's within that context now, not the Centre for Cultural Partnerships. So the tour component, uh, we offer two sort of tours in um, and around areas of Melbourne that are very, very uh, prolific in their graffiti and street art. And when COVID hit, we could no longer do that because of the social distancing measures. So we, um, made these virtual tours that have now kind of led me to a place of applying for internal Melbourne grant money to actually make the unit a fully online unit as well. So with having no lecture delivery at all, just um, 
doing it all online and creating more of these tours, which I think is an interesting potential really. And one of the things I was um, out taking photos today with a, a friend of mine and we were talking about, you know, what this context of COVID is doing to, to the idea of presentation. And I think that the reconsideration of how many artists, not just street artists and graffiti artists, but, you know, academics, researchers and others present work and present um, their ideas in this new world is going to be an interesting trend to, to sort of follow. So the, the, in terms of a pedagogy of those tours, they form part of a core curriculum of the unit. Um, and it was, an, I guess, an innovation that we undertook as a result of COVID. So the idea of this virtual tour is very much located within the current lockdown climate of COVID. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if no one else has something directly to Chris in this moment. If not, we move on to the next presentation on this panel. Okay, we move on. Thank you again, Chris. It was great. Thank you, Pedro. Lovely to see you and lovely to see everyone else there as well. Hi, Jacob. <laughs> we will keep talking. So yeah. um, now uh, I will invite uh, Emerson Radish. Um, Please take over. Yeah. Uh, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see cool. you. Perfect. I'll just um, share my screen to you all now. Where are you talking from? Uh, I'm, I'm talking from Melbourne as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, just around the corner from Chris. Um, all right, so. So firstly, good morning or good evening or good afternoon to all of you. And thanks, thanks a lot, Pedro, for organizing this. This is um, a, a great forum for us all to share our ideas and information about graffiti. And um, th thanks, me, uh, thanks to you for letting me be a part of it. Um, so so I, I would like to start by, by saying that graffiti, more, more as a, a general method of protest, is something that has always interested me, uh, just simply as a method of re reappropriating and refacing the public sphere to disseminate ideologies or messages and information that counter stereotypical streams of media and knowledge um, is, is something that I think is very important to, to the wider sphere of what graffiti can do. Um, and obviously now we're going through a global pandemic which is brought upon uh, lockdowns. So the, the idea of this presentation is me sort of questioning the, the different responses that has happened throughout the world uh, and how different graffiti artists are utilizing either their experience uh, or reappropriating their practices to suit uh, the, the current climate. Um, I've become really interested in Jill Bennett's work, Practical Aesthetics, which Chris uh, kind of touched on in his uh, presentation. Um, and I will use her theories to kind of argue that graffiti's multiple uh, responses indicate the elasticity of graffiti in times of crisis and use her theories to kind of discuss the willingness for the different communities within the street art community uh, to either adapt or continue their respective practices of mark making in the public place. Um, so I'd like to start by saying global lockdown laws uh, that have responded to the emergency spread of COVID-19 have resulted in a lot of studio-based artists remaining indoors and a lot of galleries and museums essentially closing to the public. Uh, whereas on the flip side, a lot of graffiti artists, muralists and street artists have remained relatively steadfast in their practices and have continued to paint the walls of their cities. Uh, a lot of them have continued to paint and take over public spaces to express beauty. Uh, uh, others have responded directly to the pandemic and some are just protesting respective state actions. Uh, but overall, these murals that are being made carry a lot of different important messages and attest to the power of street art during the current time of crisis and indicate the art form's continued expansion during the global pandemic, as well as its ability to spread joy, hope, knowledge and criticism at a time when other art forms are muffled. Um, I, I think this solely indicates graffiti as being an alternative powerful use of public space in a climate when many other public forums are shut down. Um, it goes without saying that the concept of public space, both in terms of people and in terms of space, is being really stretched out due to the pandemic and lockdown laws that have come with it. Um, and as the world 
uh, holistically as learning to cope with the enormous amount of changes that have been brought on by COVID-19. There's a lot of discourse and debate regarding policy changes uh, that are especially important and that are being uh, put into the discourse of graffiti. Um, we, we all know that a space that is always open for debate, especially among those who are marginalized or left out of the mainstream media is the street. And issues like privatization, surveillance, housing issues, and corporate feudalism, which all existed before the crisis, are being exacerbated, exacerbated by it today. Um, and we, we know that these issues have been and continue to be discussed in street art. Um, so, so the first question I, I wanted to try and answer is, why is art in the public space so important? And I think uh, the, the simplest answer to come to is because the crisis isn't a leveling one. It is one that doesn't target everyone in the same way. Instead, it amplifies the problems faced by those already under duress. Um, so I'll, I'll go on a bit of a tangent now and move to kind of discuss uh, Jill Bennett's uh, theory of practical aesthetics, uh, which is her um, application of Jacques Rancaire's theory of aesthesis. Um, she postulated that art within contemporaneous, contemporaneous models exists within an aesthetic continuum that connects a maker with their audience. Uh, broadly speaking, she uses a certain type of neoformalism in which humans, quote, apprehend the world with sense-based and effective processes. Um, Jill Brennett cited the 9-11 tragedy and a lot of the artworks that came out responding to the 9-11 tragedy to prove the inadequacy of routinized visual culture. Um, she used aesthesis, the clarion call of practical aesthetics, to show that rigid visual cultures in new times of crisis are almost incapable of accounting for new lines of emotion and relevance, uh, going on to suggest that because old art is shaped by media structures in times of crisis, they often become transcendent and ultimately incomprehensible. Uh, in short, Bennett is trying to say that both old art and the media within unprecedented times control the imagery thrust into the public sphere during times of crisis. However, because of their largely ossified nature, are only capable of providing skewed, unemotional, unpertinent lines of imagery. Um, she often speaks to a sort of practicality or some alternative forms of media in crisis which disavow historical context and meaning and favor an instinctual, formal and effective engagement with an event. Um, she uses artworks mostly by installation artists such as Alfredo Jar, Susan Norrie and Shona Illingworth. Uh, this one you're seeing on your screen right now. I think just because of time I, I won't give it much of a close analysis. Um, but through these artworks, she demonstrates the uh, immersive exhibitions and alternative sorry, sorry, uh, Emerson, methods of art making. Emerson, yes. we're, we're, we're still on the first slide. Uh, oh, you're still on the first slide? Yeah. Ah, I'm sorry, I don't know what's happened there. Okay. Um, I, I was, yeah, it was strange for me also, yeah. Uh, play from current slide. How about now? No. It seems like yeah. you are sharing, no, no, you are sharing a parallel screen, not the screen, maybe. Uh, okay. I'll stop the share, share screen. And now you, we have it. Okay, now it's good. Thank you. Woohoo! <laughs> cool, yeah. very good, sorry about that. All, All right. right, so this is Shona Ellingwood's um, but, uh, but well, this, I'll go, I'll go back. The speech was illustrative. We didn't need it images. But uh, when, you good, when, when you mentioned an image, we felt that something was strange. Thank you. Cool. Um, the, these, these three are the, the sort of first uh, stereotypical Western artworks that I was going over before. And um, to just catch you up, and this is Shona Illingsworth, Illingworth's uh, artwork from 2014 called 216 Westbound. Um, so moving on, um, Jojo Bennett shows that those, those particular artworks uh, utilized appropriate alternative models of image making and therefore captured uh, the atmosphere and tactile relevance of the 9-11 tragedy, therefore antithesizing informal privatized fact-oriented detailing of the event uh, as opposed to those found in mass media. Um, practical aesthetics did have a few issues. Um, and there are a few detractors that targeted the book's politically shaky premise. I think the, the most notable of its detractors was Hal Foster, who stated that it's a utopian ideology, which although sought 
uh, and emotive, emotive and truthful representation of events fail to account for power structure or graffiti. And this is where I think practical aesthetics and uh, its espousal with graffiti becomes really important um, because graffiti speaks to uh, an alternative ground of knowledge already. It is not necessarily constrained to linear or factual research, but it is instead connected to a social world and helps the power of political process. Furthermore, it is an art form already entrenched in struggles for political power. So in Bennett's words, art can generate a set of aesthetic possibilities, which may in turn inform political thinking in regard to particular circumstances. And I think that had these thoughts been applied to graffiti, an art form cemented as a counter public and vigilante form of protest, graffiti aesthetics gaps might have been filled. Graffiti not only has the power to impose a relative and truthful portrayal of events in crisis, but also holds the capacity to, to oppose placemakers higher up on the political ladder. There we go. Street protests are arguably one of the most complex forms of political discourse and join the trajectories of multiple actors within one society. In recent years, Occupy style movements have gained significant prominence occurring in developed countries such as New York, Spain, Taiwan, and notably in this presentation, Hong Kong. These movements emerge in specific socio-cultural contexts and adapt specific discourses to fit local conditions. In Hong Kong, for example, where the Occupy movement began in 1997 after the state's reverting of sovereignty to China, demonstrations of protests using graffiti became a pillar of the liberation movement. These demonstrations are laden with examples of material discourse placed in visible and significant locations to re-temporalize controlled places and freely spread information to the benefit of the Free Hong Kong movement. Graffiti created for the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong exemplifies Bennett's interpretation of A's thesis. Moreover, I think within a movement that became increasingly violent, graffiti remained one of the few peaceful forms of resistance within a city renowned for order. This capturing of the graffiti is no outlier in Hong Kong's history, however. During the Chinese democracy movement, thousands of protesters criticizing social issues in the country were stuck to walls throughout Beijing. In 2011, as a result of Ai Weiwei's detention, stentils of the artist would feature the caption, Who's Afraid of Ai Weiwei? was seen all over Hong Kong. And in 2014, during the Umbrella Movement, thousands of post-it notes were placed on a wall outside the state's legislative complex, now dubbed the Lenin Wall. During COVID-19 lockdown, Hong Kong, I think, remained a hub for graffiti protest aesthetics. One piece, for example, posted on a wall of a train station, which read, there can be no return to normal, because normal was the problem in the first place, garnered recognition and new sources globally. I think these artworks exemplify a contemporary aesthetic of protest graffiti in Hong Kong. Their single color intellectual mark making placed in areas that are both significant and visible, which is much like the graffiti seen in previous years there. At a time when a major force such as COVID-19 displaces people and renders locations for gathering obsolete, public places remaining accessible take, in, take on a heightened state of importance. Throughout Hong Kong, simple messages urging, urging the public to wear face masks became a common sight. Moreover, after negative criticism towards predominantly Western foreigners who chose to forego PPE masks on daily outings, outcry was reiterated by graffiti around the city, many of which carried the slogan, Hey you, Guilo, are you too poor to buy a mask? It's really good, this one. Um, interestingly, too, free Hong Kong ideologies and COVID-19 messages have often been espoused. Examples of graffiti reading Stand with Hong Kong and Hong Kong is not China, messages that were archetypal of pre-COVID-19 protests regained popularity during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. These came at a time soon after Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong, presented a challenge to the Chinese president Xi Jinping by pushing a bill that would have enabled the extradition of Chinese citizens to the mainland and directly followed the growing concerns around Chinese imported cases of COVID-19 putting a strain on Hong Kong's healthcare system. These artworks speak of the informalism and adaptiveness Bennett described in practical aesthetics. I think they are powerful protest-driven works that emerge from an anti-austerity aesthetic and are political utilizations of graffiti, which encompasses, a, which encompasses a significant part of the contemporary political debate in Hong Kong. Furthermore, as they hold a universal aesthetic style of simple black mark making, their deliberate austerity elevates the messages they are sharing. This is the aesthetic Bennett uh, lauded, a reactive pursuit of art making which forgoes traditional aestheticism to spread a message and convey true emotion. In comparison, within the West, by which I mean white politically centrist countries in which free speech is normalized, the reaction I found has been quite different. 
On a local scale, much of the graffiti emerging in these countries at a similar time released issues around rent strikes, basic needs of survival, and a continuation of conspiracy-based protests like those opposing 5G and vaccines, an entirely different response to a hype surveilled public space. Or, in the few cases of graffiti as protest, as this image exemplifies, it is done poorly, as the ability to freely access public spaces for the purpose of painting has been drastically reduced or restricted, many Western artists not, using, not used to making graffiti as detractors or during times of conflict are choosing to forgo their normal practice for the time being. In an interview for Smithsonian Magazine, the art historian Raphael Schechter discussed the significance of the digital public sphere in the context of COVID-19 responses. Schechter noted that social media is becoming used by street artists in the West and suggested that because of reach, this is where change can be instigated. Schechter and others suggest that due to increasing levels of surveillance and police presence, the act of mark making in public places are becoming more difficult. The public space has in some ways turned into the private due to COVID-19, and this is a dilemma artists are being forced to navigate. This has even created a divide within street art more broadly, with a powerful and physically present artworks like those capturing anti-austerity protest aesthetics, often in countries more used to lockdown, like Hong Kong. On a global scale, I found that murals that are shared on Instagram or picked up by global news sites have the capacity to speak to the world and significantly discuss global issues. As the public space is becoming locked off, artists are adapting and uploading work on the internet and evolving to digital public space. Artists working within a digital domain must remain wary, however, as audiences can end up desensitized to digital artworks, which can become overgeneralized or overly affected by the structure and rigidity of social platforms, and thus are at risk of taking aesthetic rather than aesthetic pursuits. Most interestingly, I think, is what will happen in the divide between the physical demarcation of the public space and the digital reformations of public art responding to COVID-19. I think that graffiti can be an effective and critical art form that challenges political situations. However, due to lockdown laws, many artists around the world are reformatting their practices to approach a wider audience through the internet. Graffiti has shown its elasticity in times of crisis. However, in terms of its efficacy, the places which have existing histories of graffiti in times of censorship and restrictions are showing a greater willingness to adapt to the ramifications of COVID-19 within the physical public form. And these are my references for anyone that's interested. Thank you. It's uh, uh, great, uh, very um, uh, contextualized presentation. So uh, mm -hmm. both COVID and Hong Kong are hot issues at the moment. Yeah, I'll go um, back to one of those. Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to step in, uh, to make some questions directly to Emerson or comments. Um, they will be welcome for sure. Um, there, there were some references. Maybe we, I'm, we are using the practice of uh, placing references on the chat, and then uh, we, I will save the chat, and I will try to to take the references to share with everyone. Maybe if you mm -hmm. can do that, will be great. I think Jenny yeah. have here a, a question. Jenny, please. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yeah. perfectly. All right. I've moved room and house and everything, so it's a bit different. Um, my first question uh, is if you can copy the references, but my second one was, I don't know if it's obvious or not, but why are they using English and Chinese in Hong Kong? Are they using Chinese to talk to the community or are they using English to rebel against um, the Chinese regime? Is that an obvious conclusion or do you have, have you spoken to graffiti artists to, to get that um, that response? Um, I, I've only spoken to a few artists that are in Hong Kong and I think the the general idea behind the use of both are of course not, not um, Can Cantonese um, but English is to have a global appeal. Um, I think since about 2014 or 2015 the Liberate Hong Kong movement started to really pick up um, uh, a lot of interest in Western communities and um, a lot of sharing within uh, Western media. Uh, therefore, I think that the use of the English language or the English scripture is more an effect of that rather than anything to do with um, anti-mainland China. Um, but again, I, I only have a small sample size, so I can't say that with any certainty. 
is actually the fact that it was being shared globally had an effect on the English, not the other way around. It was, Pardon me? It was the fact that it was being shared globally made them use English more rather than they used English more so it was shared more. Yeah, I, I think it is um, to do with the fact that um, it's becoming a sort of global issue. And if all of the, the writing is mm, targeted to uh, local readers, then it's a little bit more difficult for them to have such a, a global meaning. Whereas a lot of residents in Hong Kong are bilingual and can understand English. Um, so it has the same amount or a similar amount of efficacy to the local population, but it has a far more significant amount of e efficacy to the global population. Uh, so I think it's um, the, the, the other way around. Brilliant, thank you. Mm. Thanks. So don't forget about the references that will be very useful. Yes. Uh, the, um, I don't know if someone else have any question. If not, uh, we can join questions also for the old panel. So it's not uh, in the end of the panel. So, okay. Thank you again, uh, Radish. Uh, very thankful for, for your presentation. It was uh, very present on the hot issues that are going on today. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And now uh, I will invite Anna. Anna uh, Rodriguez uh, from Canada. Um, Anna, are you there? Yeah. I am. Um, can you see me and hear me okay? Great. Yes. So nice yes. to see you, Pedro. Nice to see everyone. Uh, Thank you. Nice to see you. It is 6 a.m. here and I've been up for about an hour or so. So <laughs> just um, if I seem a bit droopy, I do have my coffee, but <laughs> okay, it's very early for me. I'm going to okay. try sharing my screen. And hopefully you can see that now. Yes, it's working correctly. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, I just, I'm getting all of the, um, let me see if I can do something else here, just so I don't see. There we go. Okay. Um, I am in a rural area. So if you find that there's a bit of uh, lagging, please let me know and I'll turn off uh, my webcam. Um, so good morning. Um, I'm Anna Rodriguez. I um, am in Canada. If you're wondering about the name, my parents are Portuguese. They're actually from the Lisbon area, um, but they moved to Canada many years ago where I was born. Um, I do uh, understand and speak Portuguese, but I'm more comfortable with uh, English. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, uh, pandemic PSAs, Raising Awareness on COVID-19 Through Street Art, um, which is um, an idea of research that I started um, just looking at this idea, not too sure what to do with it. And I always like to bring ideas to others so that you can give me feedback and let me know, you know, um, how you think, what you're thinking about it. Um, my background is a little bit different in, in terms of um, my PhD is in education. And so when I look at street art, I look at street art through an educational lens. Um, and I put a little asterisk next to street art to just say my definition of street art is all encompassing and um, quite liberal. It includes murals and chalk art and pos posters and stickers and rock art, et cetera. Um, so my research interests lie in looking at street art as a public pedagogy, which is an educational theory that is interested at looking at how people learn outside of traditional uh, educational systems. And then as well, I look at street art as a literacy practice. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. Currently, I'm a sessional lecturer in the Faculty of Education at a university called Ontario Tech. And that university is located in Oshawa, about an hour east of Toronto. I'm living about 90 minutes east of, of Toronto, just to um, situate where I am uh, in a, a village called Millbrook. Um, so 
at the beginning of this year um, in Canada, as I would imagine in the rest of the world, there was an influx of uh, public service announcements informing people how to stay safe from coronavirus, from um, you know what to do so that you don't uh, have, uh, get uh, COVID-19. So the washing of the hands, um, staying uh, six feet apart, et cetera. And so um, in, in Canada, at least, uh, I, I'm assuming in other countries as well, many of these public service announcements were online. And so I have some examples here. Uh, for example, Anna Bayang is a city councillor in Toronto, and she was providing um, COVID-19 updates to her constituents. But as you can see, the information um, that she was providing was information on her website. So she was uh, encouraging people to go to her website, find out about COVID-19 updates. Um, at the bottom, there's a video from um, the Canadian Chief Public Health uh, Officer, Dr. Teresa Tam. This was a short video that, for example, if you went onto YouTube, this video would pop up and you would hear Dr. Tam um, give information on how to stay safe from COVID-19. So as I said, many of these PSAs were online, um, although of course some of the, uh, these public service announcements were played on television and as well you could hear them on the radio. Um, but the idea I think is that access to internet is assumed, um, especially in urban areas. And what we found out in Canada um, was during the lockdown, there was a huge digital divide in major cities in Canada that was revealed as a result of the lockdown and other parts of the world as well, but I'll mostly talk to um, in terms of the Canadian experience because that's what we experienced or what I experienced. Um, so here's just a, a snapshot of, uh, uh, from a viewpoint of education uh, in April, where we have in Vancouver, BC schools um, trying to get students you know, on even footing in terms of learning at home, Manitoba, which is a, a province in central Canada, um, struggling as well to provide free Wi-Fi um, at, for uh, children that were now learning at home. And then my personal favorite is this news story from Ottawa, which is our national capital uh, city um, and a city that is considered to be of uh, better off, uh, more affluent because of the number of uh, federal uh, workers there. Um, students that did not have access to Wi-Fi at home um, were told to go to their school parking lots and use and just sit in the parking lot and do their uh, work from the parking lot as a last resort. Um, so these were uh, school boards that were scrambling to ensure that um, students would have um, not only laptops and sort of the, the technical hardware that they needed to continue their education, but as well um, the connectivity, which was missing in a lot of homes as well. So I, I believe this came to us a, a surprise um, to many people because again, the assumption is that, especially if you live in a city, you have access to um, internet. However, uh, when you can't access that internet through a school or at a library or at a university, as in my case, I had some of my students contact me to let me know um, after we were unable to go into the classroom um, to teach, um, that their assignments would be late um, because they were trying to figure out alternative arrangements for um, Wi-Fi uh, because they were, you, they were um, typically doing their assignments at the university. Um, this came to us uh, as a surprise uh, to many people. In terms of uh, worldwide, um, in April of 2020, the World Economic Forum put out some stats in terms of internet access. And according to um, these stats that they put out, 3.7 billion people have no internet access and only one in five people in least developed countries are connected. Um, a paper that I found from 2019 um, speaks to about 25% of uh, households in the United States not having access. So uh, this was interesting because they weren't talking about rural homes, which is what a lot of people will assume is that internet access um, is um, doesn't exist or is very poor in rural areas. Th this um, information was coming from urban areas in the United States. Um, so this 
what I started to think about was because I was uh, starting to see street art um, pop up um, in Canada and also online, I was seeing street art pop up with information on how to stay safe from uh, COVID-19. So I started to think, can street art, um, you know, with this sort of information, uh, serve as a public service announcement and uh, fill those gaps that may not be filled um, because a lot of this information is online or isn't available to people who um, may not have access to a television or to a radio due to homelessness, for example. Um, so those were my thoughts. And then I started to um, look at some uh, areas in uh, Canada and uh, Toronto's Parkdale is an area I know well. I lived there in the early 1990s when I was a student. Um, it has a huge uh, immigrant population, um, but as well, it's an area that struggles with um, poverty. Um, there are, um, there's currently a, a tent city there. Um, there's uh, challenges with addiction and uh, homelessness, uh, obviously, um, but it's considered one of the poor areas uh, in Toronto. Um, so uh, just doing a walk by, I found this poster uh, with this information, don't get frisky because it's risky, uh, near the tent city. Um, and it seems to be uh, information that's being provided to the community. Um, about um, don't get too close to people to stay safe from um, COVID-19. Uh, As well, a friend of mine took this picture in Parkdale um, indicating to people um, through the visual imagery and as well through text that um, we're all in this together, but we should be staying six feet apart. Um, this um, artistic intervention is quite interesting. Um, there's a community center that provides uh, meals uh, for those um, who may be homeless, but as well for uh, families or individuals who may be struggling in the community um, to uh, eat uh, on a regular basis. And so um, Barakit uh, Keswer was um, contacted by the community center and asked if she could create a, a sort of visual inter intervention that would uh, provide um, that uh, sort of information to people lining up for their meals that they should stay six feet apart. Um, because to tell you the truth here in Canada, there's been a lot of debate about the two meters and the six feet because both some, um, um, systems are used and um, at one point uh, people were saying uh, the media was just saying uh, um, stay one hockey stick length apart because there seemed to be again some confusion about um, measurements and I think this may be because people use both imperial and metric I'm not sure um, there's a other ways that people were just kind of communicating okay this is how far you should stay apart so in this case, um, what the community artist did was she um, painted these hearts just outside of the community center and, and then with the information let people know that they should stand one heart apart um, while they're waiting to go into the community center to receive their meal. And then this one uh, was interesting. Um, so somebody uh, took what is an official um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, announcement uh, letting people know and as you can see there it says six feet and two meters um, but they decided that they would add a raccoon and say okay you need to be four raccoons apart and raccoons come up quite a bit in street art in Toronto um, raccoons are a um, having lived there for <laughs> a number of years I know that there are people who absolutely love raccoons and want to protect them and then there there there's a group of people who hate raccoons and, and want them to all disappear from the city so it does come up quite a bit in um, street art so this was interesting because it could have been a humorous attempt but it also could have been a way to kind of clarify um, that information knowing that we were hearing a lot that people were having some difficulty understanding what two meters was or six feet um, was in terms of being apart um, so this is in Vancouver's downtown east side, and this is a, an area of Vancouver um, that also struggles with poverty, addiction. Um, research has shown us that it is um, Canada's um, poorest postal code. Um, so uh, there are quite a few tent cities in this area of Vancouver. And so this intervention, which was created with the um, the um, help and the funding from the city 
um, created by uh, an artist called Smokey D and a community advocate um, was created uh, purposely with the intention um, to put something in that community that would inform people that don't have access to um, you know, a TV or radio, let alone um, online uh, services to look at PSAs and let them know how that, first of all, there was a virus going on. This, um, this mural was created in April, um, but as well uh, with some information on how they could protect themselves um, from this, um, from the virus. And so Smokey D actually lives in the community and um, Karen Ward, who works in the community, wrote the text and they came up with what they felt would be um, a visually uh, appealing um, design that would, uh, that people in the community could relate to, including the language being used. Um, as you can see, the world death counts um, and recovered and confirmed or have changed. Um, as I said, this was created in April. But again, the intention was to put some information out um, to the community that may not be able to get information about COVID-19 in any other way. So I'm just going to show some other examples. And Pedro, if I'm running over time, you can stop me because these are just different examples. And then I can just move right to the conclusion. Um, so in Senegal, a graffiti artists, uh, a graffiti artist collective um, also created some murals for the community. Um, they felt that the community was lacking information on how to stay safe um, from COVID-19. And so when they looked at creating these murals, um, they thought about also um, making sure that if somebody doesn't understand the text, they don't understand, uh, they can't read French or they can't read at all, that they would still be able to um, have, be, they would still be able to look at the murals and understand that this is what they need to do. Um, as well, they talked about using colors and um, a sort of um, a design that would be appealing to the community. The idea was to draw in the members of the community so that they actually look at the murals and either read what are, what the murals are telling them, the information that's there, or that they take a, a good look at the, the imagery or the, the visuals so that they understand this is something they can do to uh, protect themselves. And then in India, um, there was um, a group of trans women who created a huge piece of, of street art right in, in front of a police station, which was kind of interesting as well, because they talk a little bit about how the police tend to harass them. So they um, did receive permission to create this piece. But when um, they um, decided they were going to um, uh, paint this and, and create this, um, this um, street art, they were going to not, uh, they were going to add text in Tamil, which is the language that um, people in that community speak. So rather than provide information in English, which a lot of um, information um, from street art to public uh, service uh, announcements in India tend, uh, will be in English, they decided they were going to use the language that's used in that community. Um, so you can take a look at that there in, in terms of um, how they um, created this piece and how it was meant for that community and specifically. Um, and then in uh, the United States, um, in the Navajo Nation, New Mexico, um, indigenous uh, reservation in the United States, an artist created a mural um, that has information in English, but also includes the Navajo language. Um, and the artist indicated that there are people in the community, elders, who do not speak English, who, don't, who would not be able to read English. And so they added, um, so he added information um, that uh, the elders would be able to understand as part of this mural as well. And then um, I bring up this uh, example from Bristol, England at a skate park um, because it's kind of interesting um, because it, the examples that I was showing um, I felt were uh, pieces that could speak to people who may not have access to traditional forms of media in order to find out information. At a skate park though, you, you might assume that um, the, um, the people that use skate parks would possibly have mobile phones, but um, the intention, um, or I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it was the intention of the, of the artists. Um, they indicated that they created this um, tile and stencil piece at a skate park, um, obviously to provide information. Um, but I thought that 
what was interesting is that um, although the users of the skate park may be connected, uh, they may have access to internet, they just may not want to look at the public service announcements that, um, that are being put out because they're not, um, they may not find them interesting. It may not be something that they're actually going to to care about. And so um, in this intervention, you do see that they're using um, a character from Nintendo, which would be um, that the um, participant, uh, that the um, uh, the users of the skate park might relate to, and therefore draw them in, and then they would be able to see that message. Now wash your effing hands. Um, so I thought that was interest an interesting piece, just because again, um, just because the PSAs are out there and people can access them. It, Sometimes they may not even look at them because they're not of interest. Um, the audience is looking for some information coming from um, another source. Um, so um, I do have a couple of uh, in uh, street art uh, pieces there from Toronto where again, um, raccoons uh, come up and I thought that was interesting um, to show um, that they uh, tend to be uh, um, a, a sort of visual um, visual imagery that comes up quite a bit in Toronto specifically in terms of with um, the street art that's being created. Um, but at the end, um, when I was thinking about this, I, I felt that the digital divide is obviously um, affecting um, the effectiveness of public health messages. So we have to think about um, ways of communicating um, very uh, important and life-saving information to audiences that may not be captured um, through these um, PSAs. Um, so then the, I thought about, you know, if um, street art is, can, you have, we have the ability um, to see, um, so uh, people that are creating street art have the ability to create messages that can be understood clearly because they're using, let's say, the language of those uh, in the community where they're creating the piece, or they're us using visual cultural symbols that the community can relate to and therefore they will um, take the time to read the message. Um, can a case be provided um, to, for more funding to create more public health art, such as the type of art that was created in that piece uh, that I showed in Vancouver's East Side where they did receive funding from the city. And again, um, it seems that these artistic interventions um, are filling a gap that aren't being covered by official PSAs. So again, um, I put out this question, you know, can we provide a case that um, more funding uh, can be created or um, life-saving information to be created uh, in communities um, so that people get the information that they need. Um, so that's the end of my um, presentation. Um, there's some contact information there. And um, I'm just wondering if anybody has any questions or comments. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for your presentation, uh, your work, and uh, to be there to share that with us. Uh, Thank I, you. Um, it's a very interesting perspective. It's non, it's not unusual uh, because, well, uh, when you think about public announcements, uh, you think of something that's on the other spectrum of communication that graffiti is, correct? But in some, somehow they connect mm -hmm. and you prove that. So I don't know if, yes, somebody have some question for Anna directly or we move forward for the next, uh, for the next presentation. And in the end of the panel, we can talk all about several subjects. I don't know if someone or in the chat or raising it, raising the hand. I have to tell you that here in Lisbon, we have seen some uh, um, works that uh, were doing that job. Uh, we have seen something uh, um, like uh, it was like a pochoir, like a, a collage with uh, mm -hmm. with a, a photograph of someone with this uh, full um, full vest and with the mask and stuff and with a with a with the hands uh, hang hang uh, holding a, a sign saying stay home, mm, yes. stay safe, this kind of stuff. 
yes. I think everywhere a bit this this could uh, could have been seen, but uh, yeah. Uh, there's a a question. Uh, Mary, do you want to play it by your own voice? Because it's yes. written on. Yes, thank you. Yes, okay. Um, so actually, this is the same question that I had already had on Thursday. So I, I still haven't found any uh, research. Maybe I, I should look more, but about uh, studying empirically, like uh, is there really what kind of impact with the street art works themselves, and uh, and or are they just working as a kind of a support material for something that some dis uh, discussion or discourse or topic that is already ongoing. I mean, this would be really interesting to study. I have read some articles about research that try to uh, change the attitudes and behaviors of, of this, this small uh, fisherman village people who, who were overfishing the the waters and they they use this street art project but the project ended with the results that actually it didn't uh, matter or did it didn't have any impact later on so i mean how could we make or how how could the artists make such street artwork that really would affect on people mm -hmm. and Another research was about this uh, similar topic. Well, it wasn't about street art per se, but it was about how to uh, try to uh, inform people and and change their behavior. And it said that, or suggested that if the topic is specifically about one's health or the health of, of one or, or his or her, her close ones, then it is taken more seriously than, let's say, environmental mm -hmm. issues or, or political issues or something else. Yes. Um, well, it, this is uh, more like a comment than a question, but I, yeah. I don't want, I, I don't know if Anna wants to add something to this. Um, so, I mean, this is the, the struggle sometimes uh, doing uh, research with street art is how do you find out how it's impacting a community. Um, so when I was doing my doctoral uh, work, I had this conversation with my supervisor and we, uh, I ended up abandoning an idea of trying to measure the impact of a piece in a community because we felt it was just beyond the scope of, of my dissertation. Um, but we talked about different ways, um, including um, speaking to the community. So, um, and measuring that impact by interviewing people who interact with the, the piece on a regular basis. So I think the piece, for example, in the downtown east side, the mural, although it has been funded by the city, there's that potential that um, they could, um, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any research that's doing being done in that area, um, but there, there is the potential because you do have a particular community and the, the art was created for that particular community, there is the potential to be able to um, go out and speak maybe to the, the people that work with uh, members of the community, the community advocates, but also those that live there and um, try and figure out the, um, try and research the impact of, of a piece, um, such as that one that's providing that information. Um, having said that, that piece was a second one that was funded and created by um, Smokey D in that city um, or in that area of Vancouver. Um, they had created one in 2019 with information on opioids because um, it's a community, it's an area that's dealing with a lot of overdoses. And so they also felt that a mural was the best way to communicate information on how to say on, on safety um, issues and where to go to get help. Um, so I, it's difficult, but I think it's possible. It's just, um, it would, it's in my mind, it, it would, it's a, a larger, it's a project that would take a lot of time, a research project that would take a lot of time. And, um, you know, I'm open to hearing um, if, if others have done it or if they're interested in doing something, I'm open to hearing um, more ideas, you know, on how to do that in a way that's more effective. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
someone else have something for Anna directly or should we move for Peter? Okay, Anna, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, thank you. Uh, we will continue with, with Peter. Um, Peter asked me if um, everyone who can uh, could turn on the cameras so we could be speaking with uh, everyone seeing their faces because he will not be presenting images, I think. Is that no, correct? No, not, not at first anyway, so it would be nice to see everyone. Uh, so yeah. if you're decent, uh, uh, you're very welcome <laughs> to turn on your camera. Um, and we'll see if, 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 if it gets too laggy, then I guess uh, we'll have to uh, switch them off again. But. I just uploaded uh, a report from Yale University about something called the Porchlight Program, by the way, uh, in the chat. And uh, it, it's a report that uh, discusses uh, the uh, measurable impact of murals. Um, so it might be of interest to, to some of you. Um, all right. So I'm going to start my presentation now. Uh, my name is Peter Bengtsson. Uh, I'm an art historian and sociologist. I'm located at at Lund University. Um, and this presentation that I'm doing today is called Follow Me, uh, Experimental Methods for Engaging with the World of Graffiti Writing, uh, as you may have seen in the uh, abstract. Oh, no, in, sorry, in the program. You haven't seen the abstract. And this presentation uh, departs from two main places. Um, as some of you may remember, uh, last year uh, at, at the Lisbon conference, I screened a 26-minute uh, video called Tracing Kegger, in which I followed a trail of tags by the Danish graffiti writer Kegger uh, at the outskirts uh, of Malmö. And in addition to showing my physical walk in this video, through overlays in the video, I also attempted to communicate the process of recollecting previously found tags uh, by Kegger and Malmö, as well as other uh, tags and phrasings that I've seen in conjunction with Kegger's tag, either in person, uh, in printed publications, or in social media posts. And uh, what I'll do now is I'll just, I'll post a link, uh, a link to, uh, to the video. Uh, that I presented last year. I'll post that in the chat so that you can have a look at it uh, at your leisure. Um, don't have to do it right now. I also wanted to point out I have um, written since, since last year's uh, conference, I wrote a short article about the video and about uh, using video as a method. Uh, and I'm posting a link to that as well. So you can have a look at that when you, when you feel like it, if you feel like it. Um, so, as is going to become clear, um, my experimentations with videography generally and uh, the Tracing Kegger video in particular are central points of departure for uh, what I'm going to be presenting today. Another point of departure is uh, an experience that took place uh, during a panel discussion that was co-arranged by Urban Creativity Lund, the research network that I'm uh, co-organizing. Uh, it was a panel discussion that took place in, in Malmö in Sweden in uh, March 2019, so uh, a little over a year ago. And by way of background, uh, as a scholar, I've mainly been focused on street art. However, I've been documenting graffiti photographically uh, for some years now. And since 2013, I've also been posting these photos on Instagram. Um, and similar to the experience that is described by uh, Eric Hannatz, my colleague from Urban Creativity Lund, uh, in a 2016 article that is called Scrolling Down the Line, I have, which was published in, uh, the, uh, in uh, the Street Art and Urban Creativity Journal, uh, I have found that photographing and posting images of graffiti on Instagram has provided me with uh, sort of a subcultural identity in the graffiti world of Malmö, not as a graffiti writer, since I don't write graffiti, but more as what uh, Jakob Kimball and, and others have, have called uh, a chronicler. Now, during this panel discussion that I mentioned in March 2019, I, uh, at the last minute, was added to the panel because somebody uh, dropped out. 
And during the discussion, which was mainly about, uh, it was about graffiti and street art in the Ursons region, so the Copenhagen area and the Malmö area, basically. Um, during that discussion, I asked the rest of the panel where chroniclers such as myself stand in the hierarchy of the graffiti world. And I was promptly and in no uncertain terms told by another panelist, a Danish graffiti writer who's based in Sweden, uh, that documentarians or chroniclers like me are lowest in the hierarchy of the graffiti world. Um, and now I'm not sure if this is actually true, uh, but the audience at the panel discussion, which to a large degree consisted of local graffiti writers, seemed to agree uh, very loudly. Uh, so, so I think that there may be some truth to it. And this experience uh, of, of sort of being put in my place uh, within the hierarchy of the graffiti world in, in Malmö is the other main point of departure uh, for today's talk. So, as I also made clear last year, uh, the Tracing Kegger, Kegger video was an experimental work in progress. And it's part of a larger uh, project about the graffiti world in Malmö. So after screening the video in Lisbon last year, I began to consider how I could develop the project further. Being experimental, I didn't really have uh, much of a plan when, when I started doing the video. It was, I, I just thought it would be fun to do and interesting to do. So that's, that's how I got started. Um, and when I started thinking about it, I, I came back to my own place in the hierarchy of the graffiti environment in, in Malmö. So those of us who study uh, graffiti and street art, uh, we often uh, end up following practitioners around. Sometimes we do this directly by doing go-alongs, going along with, with, uh, with, with the uh, practitioners as they create work. Sometimes we do it uh, with a delay as we move through space, looking for traces of uh, the practices. Um, and the video Tracing Kegger, uh, which I screened last year, is a, is a visual manifestation of, of such a search where I'm going around looking for traces of uh, a particular writer. And of course, sometimes we try to retrace uh, their steps through arch archival sources, or these days we may simply follow practitioners on social media and so be exposed to, to what they're doing. But it's it seems to me that it's always us following them. Um, so both on social media platforms like Instagram and in the physical world, chroniclers and researchers follow graffiti writers. If not in person, uh, by conducting go-alongs, then by seeking out the traces that they leave behind. And so when I was thinking about how to develop this project further, I began to ask myself, what if I could reverse uh, these roles? What if I could turn the tables and instead of following uh, the graffiti writers around, what if I could get them to follow me? And I don't just mean on social media because this was already happening. I, I already had a following uh, of graffiti writers, local graffiti writers uh, on social media, on Instagram particularly. Um, but I was also thinking about having them follow me in physical space. Uh, and thereby perhaps being able to engage with the world of graffiti writing in a new way. And so to this end, uh, and partly inspired by my previous studies of urban art collectors, I came up with the idea of first creating something that I thought local graffiti writers and, gra and graffiti enthusiasts might be interested in, and then taking that object uh, and placing it in uh, urban space. And so based on uh, the video that I screened last year, I actually created a graffiti scene, which is also called Trace and Kegger. And I'll just get a copy of it. I forgot to bring it to the table, just a second. So this is the scene I created. Um, for uh, as, uh, as an object. And um, it contains uh, stills from the 26 minute video uh, that I screened last year. And it also contains a map of uh, the area where the video was filmed and a QR code uh, that leads uh, to the full video on YouTube. So if you find one of these 
on the street, then you uh, can, can, can follow and see the, the, the video. Um, the cover, uh, as you can perhaps see, is, is hand stenciled. You may not be able to see it here, but it's also hand sewn. So, so the, the scene is, is, is completely handmade and then it's numbered out of 50. So there are 50 copies of this scene in existence. And the intention of the limited nature of the scene was to make it more desirable uh, to local graffiti writers and to uh, graffiti enthusiasts. Um, so once these scenes had been made, I began to place them around Malmö and I started posting clues about the locations on Instagram. Um, thereby, I was hoping to encourage my existing followers on Instagram to go and find these scenes uh, and thereby reversing our usual roles and having them follow in my tracks for a change. Um, and the whole project really started out as a bit of fun, just like the video that I presented last year. But I also think of it as an experiment uh, that from a research perspective may yield some interesting insights. Although I have to admit that it's not quite, quite clear to me at this moment in time what these insights are, uh, such as the nature of experimentation. I'm writing about it at the moment and I don't have any clear um, uh, conclusions about what, what this uh, leads to yet. So the clues for the different scenes that have been placed in Malmö so far are all available on my Instagram account, uh, which is just at Peter Bengtsson. Um, and I've also just finalized a short video that gives some insight into the project. And I would very much like to screen that for you now. Um, I didn't want to risk having problems with uh, the streaming and the sound on Zoom. So instead I've uploaded the video to uh, YouTube. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to post a link in the chat to uh, the video in just a moment. And uh, once I've posted it, um, I would ask you to go and watch it on your computers individually. Please leave your cameras on because I will be watching you for your reactions. Um, and then once everybody has watched it, the video is nine minutes and 15 seconds then I would like to uh, discuss uh, with you the project and uh, see if you have any comments or, or questions. Does that sound like a plan? All right. Can, then, uh, yes. Can I try to, to share my screen or you, uh, you think that can, your I, experiment, I, it's more individual? I, I, th I think it's better to, uh, to, to watch it on YouTube. Um, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna post the link here. It should work. I'm going to just open it up as well to see. The, the uh, status as a chronicler, mm. uh, whereas uh, I am uh, partly a graffiti writer, but I'm also a chronicler uh, yeah. by doing a podcast. Uh, and um, I reacted to... Uh, uh, what, what they told you in the panel that chroniclers are at the bottom of the hierarchy. Mm. Uh, this surprises me uh, as, I mean, if you would look at a uh, persons like uh, uh, Chalfant or Prigov that will be on later today, uh, or, or people who run huge uh, YouTube or Instagram accounts, they have a, a, a great powers that, that come with that. Yeah. Uh, vastly responsibility too. So, um, I think so I, I think I don't have a question to attach to it. No, but it's, but I, but it, it's it's interesting. But I think I think there are different tiers of of chroniclers, right? There there are people uh, who are who are legend legendary chroniclers and and sure. who get a lot of respect, whereas uh, people like me, uh, most people in the graffiti world, uh, don't know me. They may be following me on Instagram, but they don't know the person behind the account. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm relatively new to it as well. I mean, I've, I really started uh, documenting uh, graffiti uh, like purposefully in 2013 in Malmö. Mm -hmm. I thought I did it earlier. I'm writing a text right now where, I, where I, I actually thought I started in 2010, but I went back uh, in my archive and I realized I have photographed stuff earlier than 2013 but I didn't go out of my way to photograph graffiti. The graffiti I photographed before 2013 was stuff that I would meet um, 
in in the area where I where I lived or on my way to work. Uh, so pay or uh, train graffiti uh, that I, that I saw at the station or or when trains were passing by. Um, so, so, so I'm relatively new, uh, in, in that sense. I haven't been, been documenting it since the, uh, since the eighties, right? Well, yeah. the subject is fascinating. So, um, and, and I think we could, uh, regardless if you can use it for research or not, it would be fun to talk about as, I, I mean, I've been writing graffiti for 30 years, but I've been chronicling for two years and, and I also keep those two identities separated, yeah. but I would say that my role as a, as a chronicler uh, is held in in higher regards in in terms of uh, hierarchy. Yeah. So yeah, just wanted to get that in there. Uh, that's, nice presentation. Thanks. That, that, that's that, that, that's very interesting. I, I would be very happy to 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 speak more with you about this. Obviously. Yeah. Cheers. I don't know. Uh, I don't know who was first. Uh, Chris. I, I don't know who. Um. I that was really great, Peter. Nice one. I'm really interested in this sense of play that is imparted through this kind of work that you're doing in this methodology and like more, again, probably a comment than it is a question, but as you know, we've been together at conferences with Pedro and uh, this group in the past and Lachlan McDowell has presented some interesting methodological kind of innovations of how, you know, this kind of research and stuff can be legitimized. What role do you reckon there is within what you're doing and really sort of embedding that sense of play into things and embedding, I guess, kind of some strategies and tactics that might be consistent with the culture of more graph than street art into research like and you know and i get that you've not completed this but yeah i feel like it's fruitful ground for development yeah well th this is th th this is part of what i'm doing now so so what this is a, has become a part of is uh, a methodological study uh, which focuses on uh, how to approach and how to understand uh, the graffiti world of Malmö as an outsider, because I'm not a I'm not a, uh, a graffiti writer. I'm not even Swedish, uh, so so I'm I'm in many ways I'm an outsider to to the graffiti world here. So I'm I'm looking at uh, visual methodologies uh, mostly uh, as an approach to understanding a world that I come to as a complete outsider, uh, and. Uh, th th this is what I'm what I'm writing about at the moment, and in the context of of uh, of that uh, verbal work, I have already begun to integrate uh, the video that I presented last year, um, and I, I haven't finished that chapter yet. But I'm I'm writing about how uh, how you can communicate a sense of uh, connectedness between tags and a sense of the process, both of, of tagging as I imagine it, but also uh, a sense of exploring the tags as a researcher uh, through the medium of, of video, through videography. Um, so, so I'm, I'm trying to integrate these things, but, but there are, um, there are difficulties in, in doing this. Of course, we can create uh, multimedia texts and stuff like this now, but at my university, at least, uh, it's it's very difficult to, or it, it, it's impossible at the moment, technically, to submit a video work as as a publication in the in the database. Um, the only way to do it is to um, is to upload the full video, um, which is is not what I want to do. I don't just want to upload a, a video file. I, I want to. Um, be able to contextualize it in my own way, uh, but it has to be archived in 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 a, in a secure manner for posterity. And and with publications, you can you you can have physical copies and archives and so on. But there doesn't really seem to be an infrastructure to support more experimental forms of publication at my university at the moment. But it's it actually part of of this project is to try to push those boundaries to try to change the archive at my university and the archival means of my university so um, i'm 
trying to push as many buttons as I, as I can uh, and, and, and challenge the infrastructure of the university a little bit. There are some comments on the chat and uh, I think Jacob have a reflection. Jacob? Yes, if there is time. Yes, there is. So let me take away. Thank you, Peter. It was super, super interesting and, and fun. I was just reflecting on, on, since I was a part of the panel when, when this came up also, and I think I might have been part, I would say that the hierarchy between, uh, as, and as you pointed out, there's different tiers, uh, tiers of, of, of uh, but I would also say that the chronicler versus the writer in the most stereotypical way, at least, also are different scales or different systems in a way. That, mm -hmm. And they are also built around different types of stereotypical male ro uh, models or, or something like that. But I, I thought it was so, uh, to some extent, what you are doing here is very typical of, of uh, chronicling methods. I would say that the, 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 the Swedish database and, and news media, uh, got the const now dysfunction. They for several years had this, what they called the Kladvens calendar, which they had a, a hunt for, for street art pieces around Stockholm in, in, in relation to Christmas. So it was like a calendar before Christmas. So that's, but it also seems that what, what you are doing here is also getting into artistic research and, and what you're doing is not that far away from what uh, Kegers companion Adams have been doing, hiding stuff in libraries, et cetera. So it's interesting that it's also, you are by, you are also transgressing the traditional role of the chronicler uh, in this sense and, and more getting into a kind of post medium street art graffiti context. It was more a reflection. Have you, have you thought about this you, you switch the scale to some extent in order to become followed. Yes, that, 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 that was, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm saying now that that was the purpose, but, uh, but really I don't know if that was the purpose from the beginning. Like when I did the scene, I think I just, when, when I first made the scene, it was, it was just a way to develop the, the um, to develop the material I presented last year, and then I had just uh, <laughs> through urban creativity, I I had gotten into stenciling a little bit. So 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 it was it was just a way of of, of sort of having fun during the summer actually uh, when I was uh, at work uh, and I was sitting in the back office at, at my at my work. Uh, I work as a receptionist, as as some of you probably know uh, from last year. Um, so, uh, but, but, but yeah, I mean, subsequently I, I, it, it, it became, you know, obvious to me that, that I am sort of, I have been very interested recently in Adams and Kegger uh, and AK and, and, and that whole group, uh, Brad Downey as well. Um, and I guess it wasn't my intention, but I guess I'm sort of emulating uh, some of the some of the things that they have done in the past. Uh, but but I'm I'm trying to to put it into a, a research context, which which I know Adams is is, is also doing. This as well, yeah, and then, mm. but in an artistic research context, which is different from our traditional academic research context. Yeah. But I, what uh, uh, did I uh, did did you interpret this first comment? Uh, passively aggressively as I did as well this kind of like uh, 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 the ab about the chroniclers or yeah uh, the, the, no uh, in your video the the who the one who who's that you showed the uh, uh, the tracing Peter Bia uh, no I, I I don't think so uh no. he I, I I've had more correspondence with this okay. with this person um and uh, he, uh, I, I, I don't know how many scenes he found, but I think that he found quite a few, um, I, at least two, as far as I know. Um, and uh, no, I, I don't think that it's, uh, that it's passive aggressive. I think that he, uh, we, we had some discussions about it and, and I was actually asked if he, if I was okay with him sort of uh, taking over or, or uh, appropriating the project. And I said, 
sure. I mean, I, I put it out there and, and you can do what you want with it. So um, I don't think that it was passive aggressive. Uh, and, and I also think that the, the video clip that he posted with, uh, with sound on uh, where he's looking at me in the car, obviously that's not me, um, I think is, 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 is really funny. Yeah. Um, so, so, so I, I don't think that there was any animosity or, or passive aggressiveness there. Uh, okay. I don't because think that, 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 that could have been an example of the kind of hierarchy and system that, because I, I think that, that I, I mean, the hierarchy, I interviewed for my thesis, but I never published that chapter, 14 different people in depth interviews, uh, who were known as chroniclers. And, and they were quite famous in the respective contexts. Uh, and they were s the most common, uh, I was only one person who rejected being interviewed, who had a problem with being a chronicler. Uh, but all of, most, the most common uh, reaction was, finally, somebody taking me serious. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, really like, because they, they were, they were highly appreciated uh, in their respective context, but kind of taken for granted. Uh, and that's what was a part of the, the hierarchy, I think. Uh, and and they, even if, if writers liked, I mean, liked what they were doing and uh, uh, liked being admired, liked being collected, they were still, and liked also that they sometimes had photos of their, of, of their work. They took them th that kind of service for granted right. that they should be happy, yeah. and that's an example of that kind of uh, hierarchy that you experienced in the in the panel, perhaps. But but I, but I have to say that I mean the panel was one thing, but in my daily life, uh, when I post stuff on Instagram, I often get requests from 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 people, especially when I post videos of trains passing by. I've gotten quite a lot of requests from people who uh, who has a piece on the train and, and would like me to send the video and they're always very polite and 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 seem grateful so so, so there's a discrepancy between what was going on in the panel mm -hmm. and 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 what I actually experience um, in everyday life but it, it's still sort of that experience still sort of triggered something in me that I that I wanted to challenge, and I, I think that it has led to something uh, productive. So, so, so I'm I'm very glad that uh, that this uh, writer said uh, what he said. <laughs> Thank you. You have a question, one more maybe from Parajita. I don't know if she, if she, if she wants to give it in her own voice. Uh, Hi, I was just saying that it seemed like after that incident where uh, it was established that a researcher or a chronic chronicler is at the bottom of the hierarchy, it kind of pushed you to become um, an artist in a way because of the in intervention that you kind of took on and that was an attempt to kind of change this hierarchy in some way which, I, which was kind of answered in this previous discussion as well. So that's mm. all I was asking. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, yes, that's, uh, that sounds like great. Yeah. Anna, I don't know if you want to add something. You. Well, it was just a, a question. Um, it's a great video. Um, and I, I love the experimental nature of this academic work that you're doing. But I'm, I'm wondering if I, I see it as knowledge mobilization. And I'm just wondering if you see it as knowledge mobilization. I don't this know what that, that is. Do. What well, what is knowledge mobilization? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's a term. Uh, maybe it's an educational term. I'm so sorry. So it's a term we're using in Canada um, to talk about where we can take knowledge um, that comes from uh, research and bring it to people that are aren't researchers. So right, right, right. Okay, outside. yeah. So yes. it's also called knowledge transference. I use knowledge mobilization. So when I was watching your video, I felt mm -hmm. you know you're bringing. Um, there's so many different aspects, obviously, that we could discuss, but I also saw that you're bringing this um, research that you're doing to other people that aren't uh, necessarily in academia and wouldn't know about this research unless you created a video such as you have. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, that, that is, uh, I mean, in, in everything I do, uh, I, 
I try to be, I'm very inspired by Howard Becker and his uh, thoughts about writing, uh, that you should try to con convey complex ideas in uh, as simple a way as possible without losing nuance. Um, so I try to, to do that in my writing, but I also think that uh, moving images, also photos really, but, but, but especially moving images uh, has a way of, of um, uh, they're evocative in a different way than, than, than verbal communication. Um, and I, th I, I really like experimenting with this and trying to, to reach uh, different audiences. So, so absolutely, this is something that, um, that, 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 that I'm focused on. Um, I didn't uh, know the term, but now I do uh, for what it was I was, <laughs> I was trying to accomplish. Thanks. So, um, okay, I don't know if uh, anyone wants to add something. Uh, also, Isabel was asking something here in the chat to Anna, uh, if it's uh, similar to art-based research. I don't know, maybe you can uh, comment on that. But anyway, we also have, an, uh, <clears throat> we will have uh, the next panel. And but the panel will have the order uh, shifted, so Sylvia will be first and Mathieu after. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, I thank you very much, Peter. Sure. And uh, I think this panel was great. And uh, so um, we will move to the next one. So great. Thank you. Um, I think yeah. See. <laughs> so I will stop here. Uh